<clears throat> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last session of the uh, DMARC Online Bootcamp. Again, my name is Shazad Mirz. I'm the Director of Operations for Global Cyber Alliance. So what we're going to basically do in this last session is really just go over the just a few key items, just again, just to reiterate and just, I mean, it is repetitive, but it's just to really get it in, you know, to get people to think about it and then focus on these kinds of things that could come up and things that you need to remember what DMARC does, why it's important, and some of the things that you need to focus on when you're dealing with certain aspects of it. So it's just a quick, it'll be a, a summary of everything that we've talked about so far over the past few weeks. And then what I also wanna do is talk about some other email security mechanisms that you wanna consider using, right? Some of them will pertain to your environment and you do need to do it within your environment and they may require DMARC in order for it to be functional. But there's also two, uh, three other ones I'm going to mention and talk about that have don't have to do with DMARC. You don't need the DMARC in place in order to, to implement those and, and utilize them. Again, we're not going to go into a deep dive into each one of them, but at least to get you to an introduction to each one of those, to get you thinking about those and consider implementing those in your in your environment and putting them into place to make your email uh, security more robust. So before we go go uh, go into the key item, so. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, if you need the slide deck, the slide deck is available in the handout section, or you can go uh, to our bootcamp link and download it from them from there. Uh, also, if you do have any questions, please feel free to put those questions in the questions box that's available to you, and we'll do our best to answer those questions as we go along. All right, so let's get started with the first the key items. So the key items that you need to focus on when it comes to DMARC. To remember what DMARC is meant for and what it's created for and the major benefit to DMARC is to protect your brand, protect your domain, right? Because a lot of questions and a lot of people say that we hear that, well, DMARC doesn't really do anything for us. It really does everything for other people. And that's not really the case, right? Because DMARC is protecting your brand. You're the one who has to create it. You're the one who has to put it into place because it's your domain, right? You don't want others, especially fraudulent users, to be putting your domain name and using your domain name in, in emails, right? That's the last thing that you need. You don't want them sending out spam and phishing using your domain name. You don't want them using sending out fraudulent activity using your domain name because next thing you know, you'll be on blacklist, right? Google, Microsoft, and so on will start blocking you. And that's not what you want. You want your mails to get through. Right? regardless of what type of organization you are, you're going to rely on email to some level or to some extent. So email is going to be very important. Right? And so that's why you need to implement DMARC and why you want to implement DMARC. Right? It gives you that authentication for your domain, the reporting capability, so you know what's happening with your domain uh, in terms of email. Right? And then you're defining what the recipient is going to do with those messages. You're going to tell them that this is legitimate this is so let it go through, or this is fraudulent coming from fraudulent servers or unauthorized servers. So this is how you need to act on that, right? So those are the major benefits, right? It's protecting your brand. It's improving the trust and integrity of your brand. It's improving other things as well, right? And then box protection is already in place for the consumer side. So your Gmail users, your Hotmail users, Office 365 users, Google Workspace users, already have DMARC verification in place, right? They're there, it's already set up, it's set up by default. Many of majority of people don't know that that actually is it's set up for them, right? But you as the organization, you as the domain owner needs to do the policy part. You need to implement that policy. So this is, this protection is in place, you know, that they are protected, you're protected, and your emails are actually going to the inboxes rather than the spam folders are getting dropped and blocked because, you know, Google or Microsoft decide that you send too much spam out. And it also improves deliverability, right? We've seen cases like, you know, some third-party organizations, they've tested this, they've tried it, they've seen a 10 to 15% increase in deliverability of email messages. So rather than showing up in the spam box, they actually go to the inbox because DMARC authentication, DMARC capabilities are in place, right? A DMARC policy is there to define and allow for messages to get through. Instead of them deciding that, well, you know what? We're seeing a lot of spam activity from your organization. We're just going to block it because we don't know if it's actually legitimate or not because you don't have anything set up. You don't have SPF set up. You don't have DKIM set up. You don't have DMARC set up. 
And they will tell you that. They'll tell you that you need to have these things set up, if you, especially if you want to improve deliverability. And those visibility is going to be very important because the reports were things that we talked about almost every week. Reports, reports, reports. And the reason we want to get that inside of everyone's brain is because those reports are important. Those reports are the only way you get to know what's actually happening. Right? What's actually happening with your messages? Are they passing? Are they failing? What is the, where is the error? Is it an SPF? Is it in DKIM? Where is the issue? And hopefully you fix everything that's correct, and everything that's legitimate and that's authorized, and everything else that's remaining is going to be just spam or fraudulent type of activity, which hopefully will all be rejected and dropped. Right, so it's very important to get those into place. But then also remember, though, DMARC is not your silver bullet, right? DMARC is not going to be the thing that's going to, you know, prevent all phishing and you know, all phishing types of activity. It only protects against one type of spoofing and that's domain or direct domain spoofing so someone from using your own legitimate domain that's what you're what you're preventing and what you're protecting against right so that's what you want to that's why you want to put this in place but you still need those other mechanisms in place in order to protect against other types of phishing and other types of spam activity so your anti-spam anti-phishing tools still need to be there right you still need to have that an email security gateway in place. But also remember where you what you're going to create these policies for. You're going to create for all public facing domains. Right? If you own that domain, it's public facing, regardless of whether it's used for email or not, you want to create a DMARC policy for it. Right? Create that policy of reject for those that are not being used for email. You know, put in that put in the, the appropriate uh, DMARC records, put in the appropriate values, P equals to reject. And that way no one can use that domain for any email purposes until you set up SPF and DKIM and so on appropriately. Right, so protect those first and then go to the other ones and you know review those reports and do everything that you need to do. So create a policy for all public facing domains. Just remember also, right, um, when you create for the top level domain, that policy automatically applies to all the sub level domains as well. So you don't have to try to figure out, you know, do I need to do it for www? Do I need to do it for mail? Do it M and all these things. You don't have to do it. Just do it once and that does it for all of your subdomains as well. So how the process is working, right? Because you as the domain owner, remember there's, there's two parts to it, right? You're the sending organization and then you're also the receiving organization. Right. <clears throat> but when you're working out there and you know you're the one who's sending the message, somebody at the other end is going to receive that message. And each each the, the sender and the receiver has a role to play. Right. The sender is going to be the one responsible for creating and publishing the DMARC record for their domain, for their organization, and they're going to do it on the public DNS server. Right. It has to be the public facing DNS server because that's how else is the receiving side going to see what's going on. Right, so the setting that you should create, so that knows also where your SPF record is going to be. That's where your DKIM records are going to be. Right, and then remember, for the sender, this is completely transparent. You're not installing anything new for them. You're not installing some third-party plugin on the client, you know, on your Outlook client or what, Apple Mail client or whatever client you're using. They're just doing what they need to do and send out the messages as they normally would. Everything is being done on the server side. Right, so on the server side is where you're actually doing the DKIM signing, right? So that's where you get to set up DKIM and set up the DKIM capabilities. This is where all that other metadata is going to be added. So it may not be the actual, you know, it's the email server, but if you have an email gateway as well, the email gateway may be responsible at that point as well. Right, and so there's a question about, do we need DKIM for each email service or can, and can, uh, can, or can some not have an associated DKIM? Um, it depends on your situation, right? So if you're on premises and you have an email gateway like an Iron Port or a Mimecast, you can put in the DKIM in there and you can use that for all the servers behind it, right? But if you're using third-party vendors, yes, you do have to have a DKIM uh, record for each third-party provider that, that you're using. Some third-party providers will give you two, some will give you three, right? Like Microsoft Office 365, they give you two that you have to create. Right, and yes, and you do have to put both of them in, otherwise it's not gonna function correctly. 
So it really depends on the situation. So, I mean, do you need Deacon for each, each email service? Depends on your situation. So if on-prem and you have an email gateway that is capable of DKIM signing, you can do it all there with just one key. But you're going to have to do a DKIM key, right, for each domain. So it's not just because you have multiple you know, servers behind there for different domains. You still have to create a DKIM key for each domain. Right, so everything's being done at the email server slash email gateway, right? Everything is being done there. And then the next step is the receiving side needs to, will obviously take that message. Now they have to go through the filters that you're gonna that they're gonna have in place. Right. So they the receiving side has to have DMARC verification in place in order to check for the sending organization's DMARC policy or even to see if the sending organization has a DMARC policy. Right. So if DMARC verification is in place. It goes back and says, okay, this is the domain that, that I'm getting the email from. Do you have a DMARC policy in place? You do? Okay, we need to go through the DMARC checks, check SPF, check DKIM, and see if everything's passing, failing, or what's going on, and then act based on what that sending organization's DMARC policy is. Right? And remember, you have three, you have three levels of, for your DMARC policy. You have none, quarantine, and reject. So if you're at none, you're in monitored only mode, or you're not doing anything. You're just saying that I'm 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 checking my DMARC policy. I want to get reports and review everything and make sure everything is working correctly before I move on to <clears throat> an enforcement level, right? Because if you're at quarantine and reject, at quarantine, if your SPF and DMARC and alignment fails, check. So if everything fails, at quarantine, it's going to go to spam junk folder. At reject, the message isn't even delivered. It gets dropped. And then it's the receiving side that's going to send the report back. Why? Because they're the ones who see everything, right? It only makes sense to have them to be the ones to send it back to you. They're the ones who are going to see which servers are actually sending them messages. Is it a fraudulent server? Is it a legitimate server? Right? You as a sending organization aren't going to see that. You're not going to see all the spam or um, spam or phishing IP addresses that are using your domain name unless they actually send the message to you. Right, then you can actually see it. But in most cases, it may not come to you. It's most likely to come out to the to the rest of the world. And then you you know find out afterwards. So this is one way of being ahead of it and learning about this and seeing how things are going. Um, so if so there's a question is if receiving org has no DMAR check set up, what happens to the policy set up by the sender and the mail? So if the receiver side receiving side does not have a DM, have to, does not have DMAR verification in place. It treats the message as normal. It'll still go through all the regular filters uh, that are in place and then deliver the message accordingly. You know, so assuming everything is fine, it'll pass on. Even if everything is bad, it could still potentially make it to the recipient's inbox. Unless another spam filter or phishing filter or something like that detects something and puts it into quarantine or rejects it. That's a great question. You know, so if they, the recipient side does not have DMR verification, it's the message is still, it just won't do that. It won't do step five. It won't check for that DMARC record. And it doesn't, unless they have SPF and DCOM text set up separately, it's not gonna do that either. Um, and then if it, the receiving side, the recipient email server that sees, goes back to the, the sending organization's DNS server and sees there's no DMARC policy, at that point, it won't do DMARC, verifi it won't do DMARC verification. It'll just go through all the other filters. So just realize that all the other filters are still applicable. Just because it passes DMARC doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna ignore all those other filters. If there's some other filter that says like, oh wait, this is actually a spam message, right? It could still block that message, right? You know, cause in case the, the sending side, they got that account got compromised, right? And they're sending out spam and actually sending out spam using that actual domain name and that correct valid IP, you know that's why you want those other filters in place because it can block it can still block those types of messages as well. So DMARC is just one layer of all your filters that you're going to have in place. So when you're creating D, uh, DMARC, right? You're creating a TXT record in your in your public facing DNS. And the key things to remember here is what the name of the record must be. Underscore DMARC. You have to have that underscore. If you remove if you forget to put the underscore in. It's, gonna, it's not going to find the DMARC policy because that's what verification tools are looking for. They're looking for the underscore DMARC and then your domain name. 
And then after that, it's going to look at the value and follow based on what your value is. Right, and I'm not going to go through all of these again, but I just want to remind you that which ones are required and what the, you know, what the differences are here. So by the ones that are actually required, so based on the R, D mark RFC is V equals D mark one, which is the version and P equals. Those two are the ones that are required. You have to have those in place in order for a D mark policy to work. So V tag first, P tag must come second. And then after that, it can be in any order. We're saying that RUA equals required. Right, so I'm saying RUA is, is, is going to be required. And the reason, I'm, again, I'm saying that it's required because that's the only way you're going to know what's going on, right? And I keep repeating this over and over again, and that's on purpose, right? Those aggregate reports are the reports that you want to get because those are the reports that are going to tell you all the information you need to help you determine if you want to move from your policy equals to none, right? You review the reports, make the adjustments, and then you move up to quarantine or reject. Then the rest, you know, RUF is recommended because again, you may or may not get those. Um, <clears throat> as PTAG, consider using that, you know, based on the type of environment, right? If you do not have any subdomains, put in SP equals reject while you're at P equals none, right? Or the vice versa, if you're at moving your policy, P equals to quarantine or reject, but you have subdomains that are using, are being used for email, put in SP equals none and then put in a policy for each of those subdomains. And then your optional tags, the FOAD, Kim, and so on, you don't need to define those. You don't need to put those in. But if you don't, just remember that it's going to, de it's going to go to the default value of, those, of each one of those. Right? So you don't have to explicitly define it. You can, if you want to, just for your own sake, you can do that, since a lot of people do do that, which is perfectly fine. It's not going to cause any issues if you do that. Right, it could just be just as a reminder. People use it as a reminder for their own sake, or people just you know let it you know so people coming in later they they know what's going on here and that what the default settings are. Right, but V equals P equals and the RUA tags those are the ones that we're saying are required. Use all three of those and the others depending on depends on your situation. Right, and remember, in order for DMARC to work, it needs to use SPF and DKIM, right? Because SPF and DKIM are the things that are providing the authorization and the authentication for DMARC, right? So both of these, do you have to have both of these? No, technically you don't need to have both, but you need to have at least one of these two fully functional, right? So fully functional meaning that it's passing SPF verification and it's passing SPF alignment. Both of those have to be passing in order for it, or in order for you to just use one. Right, and which, what do these do again? SPF, those are gonna be your list of authorized servers to send mail using your domain name. So those are your mail servers, your third-party vendors that you're using. And then DKIM is that digital signature that you're gonna be creating or adding. So that way every single message is being authenticated, has that digital signature attached to it. And then you have a public key which you're putting out and you're publishing in your, um, on your DNS to do the checks. Okay, so if you win and put in DMARC equals reject and you don't have SPF or DKIM set up, good chance that your messages are going to fail, <clears throat> right? Majority of your messages are going to fail, especially those who have DMARC verification enabled. The only message, the only people who will probably get your messages are the people who don't have DMARC verification enabled. Okay, but you need to at least have one of the two fully set up and fully functional. So SPF. Right, remember when you're creating the SPF record, you either use the dash all or the tilde all. Right, those are t dash all is your hard fail, tilde all is your soft fail. You know what's the difference? If you can use the dash all, but I mean, I know a majority of people actually use the tilde all, right? Because the dash all means it has to be on the list, it has to be in the SPF. If it's not there, that's considered a fraudulent message. Mark it as, as uh, fraudulent. If it's tilde all, you're basically saying, well, <clears throat> It's not on our list, so we'll you know do what you want, but can mark it as a fail and consider it a fail. SPF, you can only have one, right? Only one record can exist for that domain, for the domain you're applying it to. So that's why it's a real recommendation is to try to, if you have subdomains and those subdomains are using third-party vendors 
apply the SPF to that subdomain rather than putting it and stacking it all at the top level domain, right? Because remember, SPF has that 10 domain lookup issue. Right, so one, so you could do flattening, which is instead of using domain names, use IP addresses. But you see the problem with that, right? If you don't have control over those IP addresses, and one's missing, you could cause you know things could potentially break with SPF. You can do dynamic or instant SPF, which is we're using a third-party vendor, and in most cases, that's going to be a cost associated with it, and that's where they could, they'll basically handle the SPF for you. So they're going to use macros and uh, regexes and whatnot to, to control your SPF. But then you could do like what I said, right? If your subdomain is the one that's actually using those, uh, those third-party vendors or those domains, then do put it there instead rather than, you know, rather than putting it at the top level domain, because that at least spreads it out a little bit and now you're not stacking everything right on top. Right, and then just also review it. If there's a third-party vendor you don't need, then remove it. Don't use it anymore. Right, or because some cases a lot of people have found that they they have three marketing tools. All each one of them does the same exact thing. So instead of using all three, they consolidate it down to just one. Right, so that's another option that you have in that space. But also remember making sure, like I mentioned in the last slide, when you're setting up SPF, make sure if you're just going to use SPF by itself and DKIM is not available, make sure you have alignment and verification set up to work fun to work correctly. So what is what is verification alignment again? Alignment is making sure that the from address matches the return path. So as long as both of those match up, you're aligned, okay? If they don't match up, like the second example is info at Global Cyber Alliance, but the return path is this mail 58.atl11.rsgsv.net. They're two different domains. So therefore you're unaligned at that point. So a DMARC would consider that a fail. But remember that SPF verification is different. SPF verification is just gonna take that one domain from the return path or the envelope from and look that domain up for SPF verification and check that domain. So that's why the second one, when it says received at dash SPF is passing, because look at the domain it looked up. That domain, it looked up that domain and said, oh, you have an SPF. Okay, what is, what's set up in your SPF? Okay, this is this IP is actually on your list. So therefore we're letting it pass. Right, but for DMARC, you want to have passing alignment. So you want the first two to match up but then you also want SPF verification to match up as well. And the only way you can achieve that is by making sure the from address and the return pass, path uh, match up. And this is mainly an issue that you're gonna see with third-party vendors, right? So setting up SPF with third-party vendor is gonna be difficult. It's not an easy thing necessarily to do. Some vendors play well, some don't, they just don't. I mean, and there's not much you can do about that situation. That's why it's important to make sure if they have DKIM set up, set up DKIM because for them, setting up DKIM is much easier and have to be able to associate it with your domain as well. So remember when it comes to DKIM, it's a PKI, right? So you have private keys and public keys. So if you're doing and handling the keys yourself, make sure to protect that private key. Make sure it's somewhere safe, somewhere secure, but also somewhere where the system that needs it can you can get to it to do be able to do the DKIM signing? So then you're gonna publish the public key. Right? And you can have more than one record. You can, and you get you're going to. If you especially if you use third party vendors, you're gonna have more than one record in place. If you just have on-prem systems and no gateway, you're gonna have multiple records as well. But if you just if you have an email gateway, you most likely could, you know, good chance you may just have one unless you have two or three email gateways and you're going to have to set it up on each one. And remember DKIM, DKIM uh, records can either be CNAME or TXT, depends on who you're working with. You know, so especially if you're using a cloud service provider, make sure you can try to use DKIM, try to get DKIM in place at that point. Okay. So that's where D, so now the other thing in terms of DKIM also is to consider is that you're gonna have multiple records, but make sure you follow thoroughly and come to completion what a vendor tells you to use and what a vendor tells you to implement. Don't just 
put in whatever you want or create your own DKIM keys and tell the vendor to use it. No, the vendor will tell you what to do, right? The vendor will tell you what to do and then that's how it's gonna work and you copy exactly what they tell you to do. And then DKIM also has the thing about alignment and verification as well, right? So DKIM alignment, again, is gonna be is making sure the from address matches the domain that's in the DKIM signature. Right. So as long as these two match, you have alignment in place. If they do not match, they don't match, then it's going to be a failed unaligned. Right. And that's a DMARC failure. And then that's it's not going to pass DMARC. So how can, does DKIM pass? Because remember with DKIM, what it's actually, when it's checking the DKIM signature and what is it comparing against is the public record for that domain that's in the DKIM signature. So mail a.mcsignup.com has a DKIM, sing, DKIM public record in place. So when they went to look it up, it passed because it exists and it matches up. But DMARC is going to say, well, that's fine. DMARC verification happened, but guess what? It doesn't align because the domains are different. So since the domains are different, this is where the, the issue is at, the issue occurs. All right, and that's just like SPF. So there's a question about SPF. So before I continue on, let me go back. So with SPF, right? So alignment is the from, right? The from address matches the return path address. That's alignment. Verification is taking the return path domain and looking that domain up. That's what SPF verification is doing. So SPF verification will look up globalcyberalliance.org, make sure it's coming from the an authorized system. So the IP address or domain that it might it finds in the in the email headers, is that the right is that one that's associated with Global Cyber Alliance? Same thing here. So mail 58 and so on. This is the domain SPF verification is checking for and looking up. And that's why here it's passing because this domain, whoops, this domain has an SPF record and that this IP address is a permitted sender based on the, this domain's SPF. That's SPF verification. So what is needed in the SPF to enable al SPF alignment? Um, it's not just things that you need to put into SPF. You also, in, in most cases, I guess this is a situation with third parties. So you, one, you have to have whatever whatever system that they say to implement and put in, right? So SendGrid, Google, Office 365 will specifically say, put this part, this include statement in your SPF, right? And that is technically supposed to associate with that domain. But when they actually go to the email, there's that's where the issue ends up happening and they don't always put in your domain they end up putting in uh their own domain uh so it's an issue we see a lot with uh, like mailchimp and hubspot um salesforce and so on usually those third it's usually third parties we see those issues with and it's really on them so you I mean you could put in the statement that they tell you you can validate it but if they don't do it and they don't set up the right way it's it's going to be difficult to do. Whereas in your own systems, it's easy to do because all you have to do is put in your IPs or put in the MX tag and it is, it's associated with your domain anyways at that point. Uh, so remember and when you're using DNS, right? DMARC again, just one record per domain. SPF, also one record per domain. But remember what you name your SPF record, right? There is no name that you're giving it. You want to just use the default, the fully qualified domain name. So depending on your DNS, either you need to put it the ad in there or just leave it blank. DKIM, you can have multiple records per domain. A good chance you're going to have that unless you only have one email system that you're using and you don't use any third-party vendors, right? Then you may have just one. But also remember when it comes to the name of the DKIM record that you're creating. So if you're the one creating it, you're going to define a name, So which is the selector. That selector is going to be unique to your domain, unique to you, and you can make it whatever you want. Then after that's the dot underscore domain key. Just remember when you when you're the one creating the selector, just remember what server or what system it's associated with. <clears throat> Otherwise, 
again, always follow what the vendor tells you to create. If the vendor give, will give you specifically, this is the name of the record you need to create, this is the value of the record you're gonna put in. That's what you follow, you don't make up your own. And then don't forget the last step is that in most cases you have to go back and enable it. Right, remember when I was showing you with Office 365, once you create the records, then you have to go back into Office 365 and enable it. Because it's gonna to check to make sure and confirm that you have the records in place. And once the records are in place, <clears throat> then it's gonna consider valid, valid and it, then it will start doing the DKIM signing. Okay, for Linux, check out where you have that dollar sign origin. Because remember anything you put after that, you don't need to put in the fully qualified domain name. You can just put in underscore DMARC or selector dot underscore domain key. Um, also remember you get any quotation marks. <clears throat> so unless you're using the GUI version of it, but if you're going to the actual, if you're using command line, make sure those quotation marks are in place. Why? Right? Remember in semicolon in on Linux, uh, Linux the in bind when you use a semicolon, anything after the semicolon is a comment. So it's basically don't recognize it. Don't put it as part of the code in essence. So that's why you need the quotation marks is the quotation marks pre preserves that semicolon in your DMR policy and also in your DKIM uh, record that you're creating. But just be wary of the DNS system that you're using because you may not need that fully qualified domain. You may not need to put all of that in there. You may not need the quotation marks. It may automatically put in the quotation marks for you. Because you know, I've seen that in Cloudflare in times when we put in the quotation marks, it, dump, it puts the quotation marks in twice. So you don't need to put in quote, uh, quotation marks there. So those are things to take a look and, and things like that. So again, DMARC reports. Remember the two types of reports is the aggregate report and the forensic report. The aggregate report is the one that you really want to get. Right, that's the one that's going to have the IP addresses of the systems that are using your domain name, <clears throat> and those IP addresses could be the, will be the legitimate ones, and could also be the fraudulent ones as well. Right, and it's also going to tell you what's going on with SPF. Is it passing, failing? What domains being used? Is it you know is it aligned or unaligned? Same thing with DKIM. Is it passing, failing? What domain is being used with DKIM? Is it aligning or not aligning? That's why those aggregate reports are gonna be so so key. So you wanna make sure you put in that RUA tag and then put in the email address that you want these reports to come to. And the aggregate reports are the ones that are the XML documents, right? Those are the zipped attachments, then the email, uh, you'll have the XML document inside that zipped attachment. And then you need some sort of mechanism to be able to view those. Whether you use the paid services or use the free option, that's really up to you and which, which best suits your organization. And you could potentially get a large amount of reports. With aggregates, so it really depends on how many messages you send, how many domains you send to, and how many reports you get to get back. <clears throat> so, but those reports, the aggregate reports, are the key ones because they're the ones that are going to give you that all that information and the rich information. <clears throat> the forensic reports or failure reports, the RUF ones, you may or may not get those right. There's that privacy concern around that because this is actually showing you the message headers and is showing you the message body. So the sensitivity around what could be in the message body. What kind of information could be in the message body, right? Could there be PII? Could there be health-related information? Could be could there be you know banking or financial information in there that people shouldn't be able to see? So that's why a majority of the organizations out there do not send RUF reports, right? Because that's why we also recommend it because maybe you might get one, but you know the chances are, are are slim. But we I have seen a few that have come in, and they can provide some le level of usefulness, especially if you're at P equals none, right? Because you may actually see if it's a spam message. So if it's a spam message, then you know, okay, I need to work harder to get up, you know, quarantine or reject. But then you could also see it's based on the message that, you know, is DKIM failing or is SPF failing? Which one is the, what's the specific message that's actually failing? But again, assuming that you actually get any of these reports. So then what are your next actions? What are your next steps? Right, and you, you got the reports, you review the reports and you adjust SPF and DKIM as needed. While you're doing that, look at all your public domains that are not being used for email and put them to reject. Create a DMARC policy at reject. Create that blank SPF record that I mentioned when we, we did the demos in uh, week three. Right, check everything. And then once you have everything, you know, it's, when you're at P equals none, you know, then move up to quarantine and reject. 
<clears throat> how often do you need to review the reports? You don't need, I mean, honestly, do you have to really review the reports when a quarantine reject? No, not really. I mean, but it's good to still get them because if something were to happen or if something new, a new mail service was added, you can review those reports and take a look and make sure everything is set up correctly. Instead of turning them on, then waiting 24 hours or whatever amount of time that you have set that set it up to for, to get a report. Right, but don't just stop at DMARC, right? Because DMARC, like you mentioned, right? You have your anti-spam, you have your anti-phishing. You have DMARC and DMARC in place as a policy, and you also have your DMARC verification enabled and turned on. Consider some other email security mechanisms as well, and this depends on your situation. Right, and this is a nice graphic that we took from medium.com. So this image belongs to them. So you know, make sure if you're gonna use this, make sure you provide the source. <clears throat> um, but in this case here, these are the ones that work together. So SPF, DKIM, DMARC, ARC, and BIMI are the ones that are, you know, are in the you know work in some level of combination. Right? DMARC uses SPF and DKIM. BIMI needs DMARC to be in place. ARC is going to be used to preserve your SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. So let's go through a few of these. So again, I'm not going to go into a deep dive. I'm not going to tell you how to do it and how to set this up. Uh, hopefully my audio is still there. Um, <clears throat> but ARC, ARC stands for received, Authenticated Received Chain. And what this is doing and the purpose of this is to make sure not to break email authentication, to preserve email authentication as it goes through different hops or different intermediaries. And those are mainly going to be your mail forwarders and your mailing list servers. Those are the machines that should be considered to have ARC in place. Otherwise, you don't need it. Right? As an organization, you may not need like Global Cyber Alliance. We don't need ARC. Right? Because we don't have mail, we don't have mail list servers, we don't have mail forwarders on our place. Granted, we use Google and Google uses ARC. But those are the types of like there are people who are going to use it, like so Google Groups, uh, Yahoo Groups. They're going to need something like ARP because those are mailing list servers, right? Because when you send a message to that system, that system then passes on the message to all whom, whomever is part of that mailing list, right? So now that mailing list server is the is the IP, right? That's going to be for SPF, and so that's why SPF breaks that for your domain. <clears throat> So again, not everybody needs this. Not every need, everyone needs to do this, right? I mean, some universities might need to do this because you know a lot of universities do have mailing list servers in place and mail forwarding type things. You know, maybe if you're a marketing type firm that you take messages and pass messages on for people, you may need something like this. But again, not everybody needs this. Not all organizations need it. Just make sure you have DKIM set up correctly and DKIM typically is preserved on forwarding and things like that. All right, so that's the kind of thing that you know you need to do. <clears throat> um, another thing, so so that's ARC. So for ARC, if you need more information about it, I mean, I don't have a whole lot because the ARC working group does like to keep a tight hold on it, but they are great. You know, go to arcspec.org. You can ask any questions that you have about ARC. They are really good. They're very, they're responsive and they're very helpful, and they could should be able to uh, help you on with this. Um, so someone's asking about Google Groups. Do we need ARC? No, ARC is already implemented on Google Groups. Google already did that. So you don't need to do anything. So those like, you know, Yahoo Groups and Google Groups, they already did ARC and they implemented ARC for everybody. So there's not, it's not necessary for you to do anything there. Uh, BIMI. BIMI is something that's getting a lot of traction as of late. It's called, BIMI stands for Brand Indicators for Message Identification. Right, so in order to use BIMI, you do have to have DMARC in place and it has to be DMARC policy of reject or quarantine. They check for that, right? Cause that's your, that's, so BIMI in essence uses DMARC for that as, as a level of authentication, as a layer of authentication. We would then therefore, you know, BIMI then therefore uses SPF and DKIM through DMARC. Okay, so that's a requirement for the bit for BIMI to be in place. And what you're going to basically do is here is you're going to do similar to what you do with SPF, DKIM, and uh, DMARC. You're going to create another TXT record in your DNS. The host name will be default underscore BIMI. And then you're going to create a value where you're defining vehicles BIMI1. 
You're going to find the location of your image file and then the location of a certificate file. And that certificate file is going to be a VM, VMC. That's what they call it. It's a verified markup certificate. It's a new type of certificate that's that they're using for this. Um, that they're using for this. And that certificate, you can only get from two vendors. One is Entrust, and I don't recall who the other one was. <laughs> um, and right now it's you know, you can go and go to those sites, try to get a VMC. Uh, I'm not sure what the cost is because I mean when I we were work GCA was working on we're working on it within the, in their terms of the pilot phase with them, uh, with them Valley Mill and Google, um, because right now Google supports it and Yahoo support it. Those are the two entities that that do support it and that and they should be sometime either I think later this year they're gonna you know start actually in, implementing and making utilization of BIMI. Um, <clears throat> So you do. So there's a good chance of that certificate. You may have to purchase the certificate, right? I don't know what the cost is going to be associated with that certificate, but you may have to actually purchase the certificate. Uh, the certificate, not just anyone can purchase it, because you actually have to tie the certificate with a, a, a logo. So they ask, and so there's a lot of verification that has to actually go. They, they go through. Will they change that? I'm not sure either. But the idea is that you, you actually have to do uh, visual verification. So you have to prove that you own the domain. And then you also have to uh, actually go through uh, uh, a video conference with somebody to authenticate you. So they actually ask for a valid ID. So they want to see a driver's license. They want to see a passport. And they will check. <laughs> uh, like I tried it when I did it. My passport ended up actually being expired. I didn't notice that they told me and they said your passport is expired so therefore we're not going to accept that as a valid form of identification. Uh, so it has to be something that's <laughs> that that is that is um, up to date. So I ended up going a different route and using my driver's license for it for verification. Um, so they do do they do do, do those checks for that. Um, the image file that you're going to use is going to be an SVG file so it's a specific type of file that you're going to be using and implementing. So, you know, you can go ahead and go through the process. Uh, again, I'm not sure exactly whether you can get the certificates yet or not. I just recently saw an email come out today actually saying introducing it from Untrust. So it's possible that they started today and allowing people to go through and get the, to get the uh, certificates uh, through them. But for more information, you can go to bimigroup.org and bimigroup.agari.com. Now, I'm not sure if it has an RFC, to be honest. Um, I haven't really looked. Uh, it's been a while since because it was all in the pilot phase and in testing phases. Um, so I'm not 100% sure if it has an RFC or not. They should, but I could be wrong. Oh yeah, so yes, thank you. So somebody mentioned DigiCert. Yes, that's the other one. So Entrust um, and DigiCert. That's the DigiCert is the other one. Thank you uh, for sharing that. So that's Bimmy. <clears throat> All right, and that's everything that you can. So that's how Bimmy works. So Bimmy does require a DMARC in order for a work. If you don't have DMARC at reject or quarantine, your uh, the BIMI, BIMI is not going to work. Now, these next two that I'm going to talk about are completely separate from DMARC. So they have no association with SPF, DKIM, DMARC, BIMI, or ARC in any way. This is a completely separate email mechanism. And that first one here is DANE for SMTP. So DANE stands for DNS-based authentication of named entities. And what they're doing with this is they're using this to establish encrypted TLS connections and forcing it to be enabled and established, right? Because the disadvantage of using just like, for example, just using star TLS is that if the other side doesn't have a TLS enabled, they can technically downgrade it or they can say, we're not going to use TLS, so let us still, you know, so, but, but we can still communicate even though we're not using TLS. Right, so this forces the establishment of encrypted TLS. But if the other side doesn't have Dane, then it's you know then you still have those weaknesses in place. So it's still in order to have Dane to work fully, you do both sides need to actually have Dane in place. Right, and in order for Dane to work, you're using DNSSEC. So DNSSEC, domain name system security extensions. Right, because it's relying on your DNS and DNS security to make sure that everything is functional, everything is authorized, everything is correct and valid uh, within DNS. 
All right. And so Dane is also it uses X.509 digital certificates. So you do have to create records. You're using you are using digital certificates. And these are certificates that are typically only available by getting them from a registrar. You can create your own and do your go through the process of doing it, but the registrar has to be supportive of using that. And you're and once they do that, you know, they'll give in most cases they'll actually give you what all the records are that you need to create and put into your DNS. All right, and the RFC for Dane is uh, 6698. But things to consider. Does your registrar support DNSSEC? Not all of them do. I mean, not all of them support it for .org, right? So you may have to move to a different uh, a different uh, registration or a different DNS hosting provider so that you can actually implement DNSSEC, right? Then you also, does your email cloud service provider support DNSSEC? Right, Office 365 does, Google technically does as well. <clears throat> and then you have to create the appropriate DNS records as well to support DNSSEC and also to support Dane. <clears throat> and this is something that is, Dane is supported by Microsoft. It is gonna be implemented in Office 365. Um, I believe it's supposed to be this month for outgoing messages and then for incoming messages, they're gonna do it by the end of the year. Um, but a lot of articles I'm seeing, they supposedly they, they should already be in place. But I'm pretty sure it's supposed to start this month. But just go, if you have Office 365, go back into it and see if, if the Dane options are available. I don't think they are yet, uh, but they should be available this month for outgoing messages. And then by the end of the year, they should be available for incoming message, messages as well. So this is something you want to do. It's something that you should do because it's going to help protect against various things like DNS hijacking, man in the middle type of attacks, and uh, DNS cache poisoning type of activity. So it's, you're securing your email even further by doing this. Another option is MTA SDS, which stands for Mail Transfer Agent Strict Transport Security. So this is very similar to Dane. It actually achieves the same things as Dane does too. Right, it's gonna also protect you against DNS hijacking, DNS cache poisoning, and a man in the middle type of attacks. But the difference between the two is that whereas Dane relies heavily on DNS and DNSSEC, MTSTS is gonna rely on SSL certificates. And then we're having a, a web system, a web server up in place and having those systems up in place. <clears throat> but it's gonna do the same thing is that, <clears throat> excuse me, so it enables mail service providers to receive TLS secure SMTP connection. So again, it's going to make sure that both sides, if as long as both sides have MTA SDS enabled, then both sides are going to say, we're using TLS to do communication. We're not, otherwise, you know, otherwise we're not talking. But again, both sides have to have MTA SDS in place. So if one side has MTA SDS and the other side has Dane, it's not going to force TLS. <clears throat> I mean, it should hopefully by default still use TLS, but if for some reason something's going wrong, it can downgrade and not use TLS if it had to. So that's why, you know, you want to use Dane and or MTS. You can technically, you can use both at the same, both at the same time if you choose to. Um, but the thing is, again, for MTS, yes, it, the way it works, it does use DNS as well, but it also uses your web server as well. So on the web server, you're going to have a, a, a particular host name that you're going to connect to, and that's where you're going to put certain, a certain file that defines, these are my MX servers. So these are the servers that are used by my organization <clears throat> specifically. I mean, not the third parties, just the ones for your specific organization to allow for secure communication. Right, so this is making sure again that have that TLS in place, have that robust transport layer security, just like Dane does. Again, the difference, this is going to do SSL. So things you have to consider when you're using MTSDS, you have to have a valid SSL certificate in order for this to work. You create a TNX, D, uh, DNS TXT record, right? So the name is underscore MTA MTA dot dash SDS, and the value is V equals STS version one V1 semicolon and the ID equals, and then a series of, of alphanumeric characters. Most people, what they do is use date and time in that, in that you know, but the, 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 character, the numbers can be whatever sequence or whatever numbers you want. But then also on a unique domain name, which is mta-sts dot your domain, you're going to put a file under dot well-known slash mt, and the file name is going to call them, be called mta-sts dot txt. And what is in that file? That file is going to define these are the mail servers 
for my domain that you can use to have, to enforce secure communication with. And then MTSDS uses TLS reporting as well. So Dane actually also uses TLS reporting as well, right? So TLS reporting definitely technically is something separate. It's not something associated with MTS and Dane. You can actually do TLS reporting on its own and separate from MTS and then Dane. But by having TLS reporting, you can see what's going on with MTS, MTASDS, and you can also see what's going on with Dane as well. Now MTSDS is supported by Google, right? So Microsoft went with Dane. Google went with MTSDS. Um, Google, I think, was actually initially thinking about Dane as well, because they do have DNS, uh, they have email servers that are being used with DNSSEC, right? Um, we actually, you know, here, we we actually tried using that, we switched over, but then we ended up breaking DKIM, um, because the DKIM signatures were set to the ones that they, def the, the servers that Google defined for us to use not these other servers that were supporting DNSSEC. So we ended up going with MTSDS because it's supported by Google. So it was, we were able to do that, implement it, and use it. If Google ever decides to support Dane, good chance we're going to probably implement that as well. So if you're using Office 365, look for Dane, put it in. You can also put in MTSDS if you're using Office 365. But for now, Google is, is supporting MTSDS as well. Oh, they do. So, yeah. So I figured they, yeah, Office 365 should still support MTSDS. So you can, I mean, you can use that, but Dane is the direction that they're, they're going to be heading towards soon. And then TLS reporting. So like this, you don't have to use MTSDS and you don't have to use Dane. You can actually set this up separately if you choose to. I mean, sorry, it is separate. You can set this up without those two, um, but it's good to have Dane and or MTSDS in place and then have TLS reporting as well. But you can do this right now without having, because what this report will tell you is basically tell you if S, S, TLS is being used, right? So that's again, assuming the receiving side is going to send you these reports, right? So not everyone actually sends these reports, which I'm kind of surprised on right now, because um, we have, haven't seen too many. I get probably three or four reports on a daily basis, uh, but that could also just be who we're, whom we're sending it to. But this is something you do want to put into place. You know, put in Dane, put in MTSDS. If you can do both, that's great. If not, at least do do one or the other, and then have TLS reporting in place as well. And so remember, these three things: Dane, MTSDS, and TLS reporting do not require DMARC in any way. This is just another layer, another addition that you're adding to your email security infrastructure to better secure your environment and allow for better secure secure communication. But again, it's one of those things that the more people that use MTSDS and use Dane, the stronger it's going to be. So we do encourage you to, to, to go ahead and put in both. So just to wrap up, so we do have all of our resources available to you, right? So dmark.org is a great site. That's Those are the creators of DMARC, the ones who put it, so they have a lot of information there. We also have our DMARC website, dmark.globalcyberalliance.org where you can get a lot of resources and a lot of information. You can also find links to BIMI, resources on BIMI, uh, BIMI, ARC, no, not ARC yet. So BIMI, Dane, and MTSTS, you can find information there. We have our YouTube channel, a lot of great videos that we have on various types of topics. Uh, community forum, so if you have any questions or you have any questions you think of later, you can post them to the community forum. Bootcamp resources, so the videos, the recorded sessions, uh, the and other resources will be available at this link. Another thing just to take into account as well, and please, if you could share this with other folks, we are taking the entire bootcamp and putting this online, not video format. This is gonna be uh, basically a learning management system, whereas it's, it's all text-based. <clears throat> you go through the different modules that are, that, are uh, that follow similar to what the boot, DMARC bootcamp is, take it at your, at your own pace. You can always go back and refer to the material that's there as well. Um, and we have certificates also. So after you take the entire course, uh, you answer some of the quiz questions that we have there, you get a certificate at the end. So if you go to edu.globalcyberalliance.org, it's there, it's live now. So feel free to you know go back in there and take and go through that. Uh, if you, especially if people who are looking to get that certificate, this is one way to get the certificate if you weren't able to get attend all the sessions uh, over the, the past five weeks. Um, 
and then please share this with other folks too. let them know because you know that this is this 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 information is available to them so final items we'll be sending out a survey uh it should be coming out either it should be come out you should get receive the, the survey by the end of the week so if you have the time please fill out the survey let us know how we did how things how things went or if the things that we need to improve upon um we're also going to send out the certificate of completion but again remember the certificate of completion is only if you attended all five live sessions right that's the only way you're going to get their certificate and that's what we've been saying every 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 session that that's how it's going to work so you know we should have those certificates sent out hopefully by the end of the month if not sooner uh we just have to a few processing things that we have to get through uh, if you're interested in any other gca projects that we have so we have our cybersecurity toolkits you can go to gcatoolkit.org see the cybersecurity toolkits for small businesses elections and journalists we're always looking for feedback and some information on there aid has to do with iot this is a new project a project that we've been working on to collect a lot of data based from honeypots and see what kind of activity is going on so if you're a researcher and you're interested in that let us know also domain trust is going to be a, uh, something that we have uh, we're hoping to push out soon that's going to allow uh, reporting of malicious type of activity malicious domains and try to you know hopefully you know maybe somewhere down the line take down uh, sites based on what's been being reported so we do have some uh, I think there's like one or two questions I'm going to see if I can get to those but if you can't stay any longer I know there's only I mean there's four minutes left so if you do have questions post the questions up on the the Q the, the questions box that's available if not, if you can't stay, here's our email address, gca-dmark, or you can contact me directly at smears at globalcyberalliance.org. We're happy to help you know, help you on your DMARC journey. If there's questions you have, there's things you want us to take a look at, don't hesitate to reach out. We'll do our best to help you with whatever we can to, on your DMARC journey. Just because the boot camp is over, it doesn't mean that we're disappearing and GCA is going to disappear. We'll do, again, we'll do our best to help. If we can't help you, at least we can point you to resources or help you point you to people that can potentially help you with what you're looking for and answer some of your questions. Um, let's see. So if a listserv is host in sample.domain and the mail goes out as foobar at listserv.sample.domain, do we need a DMARC record for listserv.sample? dot domain even though it's not really a domain in the sense that it does not have an soa or ns, NS records um, so technically you don't need to have a dmark record for listserv.sample.domain the sample.domains will still apply to it but the thing is is that you know that listserv.sample.domain is probably what's going to be really associated with the email server so it's most likely best to have a separate spf dkim and DMARC policy for listserv.sample.domain. You don't have to have an SOA or NS records or anything necessarily in place, but at least have something in place. Uh, SendGrid and others have bounced addresses to collect metrics in return path. If you disable this, you lose some delivery metrics. You, uh, you just have to lose this feature to pass DMARC. Um, Again, depends. So typically when it comes to these metrics with the return path and bounce addresses, it's it's the SPF side that gets impacted. If SendGrid has DKIM set up and DKIM is, if you it's set up DKIM, you're not going to face those issues. They'll, you'll still be able to get those metrics, right? Because DKIM, from what I've seen historically, 100% of the time, DKIM has been set up correctly. If just like if you're using SendGrid, right? It's just the SPF side that's not going to be 100%. So, but DKIM is passing, SPF may, is, is probably failing, but based on DMARC, as long as DKIM is passing 100%, there's no issues. We have a listener that sends email router through Exchange Online to go outbound. Should we also set up ARC for that situation? Um, Hmm, that's a good question. It should be okay because I mean, technically, everything is you know if you set up everything for the list serve in terms of SPF DKIM and DMARC, you should technically still be okay. You shouldn't necessarily need to have ARC in place because uh, at most, at least DKIM is going to get preserved um, and everything is going to look as though it's coming from Exchange Online and not necessarily from the list serve. 
Can we have SPF alignment and DKIM alignment in monitored mode without impacting DMARC, SPF, or DKIM verdict? So as long as your DMARC is policy is set to none, yeah, you're fine, right? As long as it's set to, you're set to P equals none, you're okay. But the thing is you need to, once you start going to reject or uh, quarantine, you need to make sure SPF alignment and DKIM alignment are in place and then at least one of the two is correct. How do we decipher the beginning end date range on the reports? So if you're looking at the XML, you're not going to be able to. <laughs> uh, you're going to need to have like that, like the like an XM, uh, a human to XML converter, or you know, use some sort of tool that and that will convert uh, the date range for you. And typically by default, it's 24 hours. A majority of the ones that I've seen tend to go actually go from midnight to midnight. Um, I think and there may have been a few that I've seen a different uh, time range, but the day range is typically is for that day, so 24 hours prior. Uh, but if you have, if you use those XML converters, or if you use like like DMarking has an XML uh, uploader that they'll convert the report, so it's easier to see and it'll tell you the the date and time range. Um, Easy DMark also has a free uploader, I, I believe, and that I, that will also tell you the date and time ranges of those reports as well. Can I have DKIM aligned correctly if I use 365? Yes, yes, as long as you do what they tell you to do. Because what the problem with Office 365 is that by default, it actually does sign using something.onmicrosoft.com. Right, but if you use that DKIM signature, that domain is wrong. That's gonna, that's gonna cause unalignment issues. Well, you actually, you have to go through the process of enabling DKIM, right? So you have to create the DKIM records for your domain then you have to go back into Office 365, right? Go into the DKIM settings and enable DKIM, DKIM in order for it to be aligned correctly. So there's a process. You do still have to do DKIM. You have to still have set, set up DKIM in Office 365. Don't just use the default setting. All right. So I think I got all the questions. It looks like it. So in this case, so we were two minutes over. Again, thank you everyone for joining. I hope this was useful to you and you learned a lot. Again, if you have any questions, contact us and we'll be happy to help as best as we can. But otherwise, everyone enjoy the rest of your day, your evening, afternoon, depending on where you are. And, you know, good luck on your DMR journeys. Thank you, everyone.